Oh yes, name. my name is Annette Rafferty and I was born in Worcester, Massachusetts in the old city hospital on February 13th, 1930. And where did you go to college? I went to college at uh, a Lady of the Elms in Chicopee, Massachusetts in 1948 to 1952. And what did you do after graduation? After uh, college, I had, well, first of all, I had always gone through all through public school. And this is my first um, experience being with sisters. And I, re I really had gone there with the hope of being a teacher. And I really loved the majority of the teachers that I had. And I thought, oh, you know, I was, I was a very religious person that I would maybe make a good Sister of St. Joseph. So I entered the Sisters of St. Joseph in September of 1952, and I stayed with them up for 34 years. And things had changed within the community and in the church and in my own life in particular that forced me to make a decision that I had to leave the community to give full time to this endeavor that we're talking about today. Yeah. And so how did you get to that point? When did you start getting involved? Uh, well, first of all, for 12 years after um, entering the, the uh, community of the Sisters of St. Joseph, I taught at St. Jerome's in um, inner city. I loved the kids that I had. Uh, I had a horribly difficult teaching schedule uh, because subjects were assigned by rank. So I ended up with many things that I didn't really have much talent for. So I did learn how to improvise and how to draw on other people's ability to do things. Then I was sent to an all girls academy in Newport where I stayed in the old days in Newport before it became a destination uh, place. Uh, it was an old fishing village, but this was a girls' academy. And it was, I think, during the um, upheaval of Selma, Alabama, and the march through the city in Newport, the changes that were occurring in the other religious communities in Rhode Island that led us uh, as a community down there to seek change. And we ran into some difficulty with the Reverend Mother, who didn't, at the time, didn't want to see too much change. But we pushed ahead, and um, I suffered a Bell's palsy, a terrible case of Bell's palsy, at the end of my teaching career in Newport. And so I was taken out uh, and given, sent to Springfield, where I taught at Cathedral High School, and I had all the same subject. So they, they gave me a relief there. And uh, it was at that point in 1968 when renewal was occurring in the church. and. Um, one of the, uh, one of the uh, issues that arose was updating religious communities. And it was in a section of the Vatican documents called Perfecte Caritatis that pertained only to religious life. And I got into deep into analyzing our life then with our life now with several other sisters and we formed kind of like a community life group and uh, we thought, well, in the document, it says apostolic communities um, that work in, in cities and towns under a bishop can experiment. So we wrote up an experimentation to live in an apartment in a, a parish in Springfield that recently had had this, this school closed. So we thought it would be a continuation of the presence there. So. Uh, it didn't set well with the Bishop of Springfield. And uh, one evening, he, I was called to the mother house. And as the chair, I thought, oh, this is going to be a showdown. And for me, it was a moment, the first moment of taking charge of my own life. And um, he was going on at great length about the dangers of religious women living in apartments, that rape would be almost an inevitable conclusion to this. And besides, uh, it doesn't say that we can do this, that communities are not allowed to do it. At which point I said, okay, this is it. I have to raise my hand. And I said, Bishop, I said, if you look on page 438 in section B, you will see 
that apostolic communities like ours do have the right to experiment. And his face turned red and nothing more was said. The meeting was um, ended and I went upstairs to bed and at seven o'clock in the morning, there was a knock on my door that Bishop uh, Caney, who was the, I suppose, secretary to the bishop, was on the line for me. And I went and he said, the bishop was really upset by what you had to say last night. And I said, well, I, uh, Bishop Caney, uh, what, Father Caney, I was terribly dismayed at what the bishop had to say. And he said, he doesn't know anything about canon law. And I, he said, so he has called 11 canon lawyers to find out who's right. So uh, we waited and waited, and uh, finally in March of the following year, which was 1969, we were all assembled at Mount Marie, and at which point, in very how I, <laughs> kind of strange language, he admitted that we were right, and ended up by saying, but your bishop would like you to observe the spirit of the law rather than the letter. At which point some of the older sisters were already going, yes, they would very much like that. So um, I raised my hand again. I said, well, I'll give it one last shot. And I said, Bishop, thank you very much. I said, I would like to ask a question. Should we proceed, should we choose to proceed on the letter of the law and it proves to be a success, would you extend your blessing to it? At which point he looked at me and he said, Sister, you are a fox. And at which point I looked over at the older sisters who were about ready to cry and I sat down. And within eight weeks, I got a change of assignment out of the Springfield Diocese to Worcester. And so I, I kept saying, this is something that the church through the documents have said we need to do. We were being encouraged by many priests to move ahead with the caveat that if you move ahead, you can't stop. But at any rate, I went to Worcester and I was put in charge of St. Peter's Convent down on Main Street. They had 52 sisters living in it. And I said, well, I asked for an apartment and I've been given a hotel. So it was an opportunity, however, to be in a new, new land, a new part of, the, of the Massachusetts, and to look around at my old stomping grounds and to uh, become known uh, in the area, particularly to a young priest who was uh, very busy down at St. John's. By the, his name was Father Frank Scollin. He's now Monsignor Scollin, who had been put in charge of the um, urban ministry of the diocese. So within a couple of years, we had an election in the community. Well, this is developing in Worcester, up in Springfield, and I was elected to the executive council which was an amazing feat because I was considered dangerous for, for no other reason than speaking out. So um, I was assigned to Worcester and Frank Scollin called me and he said, we're going to be doing a study on whether there are homeless women on the street of Worcester. And I said, oh, I, would you be interested in heading up a task force? And I said, absolutely. I said, I think this is wonderful. Within two days, a phone call came from the Ecumenical Council from a Cameron McDonald, whose husband was the head of the Ecumenical Division um, of the Ecumenical Council. Um, we're going to set up a group called Women in Religion and Society. And we've got a group of women from different faiths, and we're trying to see if we can get a great big conference at the Y by 1974 on women's rights, R-I-T-E-S and R-I-G-H-T-S. Would you be interested? So I said yes to both, uh, to both invitations. And they in there was an intersection and a, a compatibility for a while between working with the two groups. And um, at any time you want to stop and answer that question, no. So 
anyway, um, I went to my first meeting and I got the lay of the land, that heavily male group of very important fig men figures in the city of Worcester, including the, the uh, district attorney at the time, John Conti, who had been a family friend, as a matter of fact, he was a classmate of my brother Phil's at Holy Cross. And he, <laughs> he became one of these no-no people, uh, unfortunately. And uh, Bishop Harrington was on it, and there was Andy Maha. There were other, you know, head honchos of organizations. There were about four women. And um, one of them uh, turned out to be a tremendous help to me. And I, so I said to the, to the women, what do we do? And um, Maureen Kroyak, who has since died, said, we've got to go around and find out if there is any meat to this at all, whether it's just a rumor or whether it actually is true. So we started, uh, and I was working full time, traveling between Rhode Island and different locations in Massachusetts. So most of my work was done in late afternoon at night. So I, for, for every month, I would go to several places, the Family Health that was down on Main Street at the time, to Mary, uh, Mary McCarthy, she's no longer there, but Lucy Candib was there, and she's still with Family Health, uh, Dr. Candib. And, uh, I went to neighborhood centers. I went down uh, to um, places that were down on um, Millbury Street, the housing uh, authority, and it was not as fancy as it is today. And I was developing statistics and finding, yeah, this is actually so. There are women out there. And I went to rectories. I went to uh, parsonages. And yes, we had uh, two or three women ringing a doorbell. and so. I would go and report the statistics to the group. And um, I said, I re there really seems like something we need to get behind because uh, about the sixth or seventh month into it, somebody said at the meeting, you know, Annette, those statistics aren't really legitimate. And uh, I said, well, what do you mean? Well, they, they, they're just statistics. They, they don't mean anything. And I said, well, where does a woman go to become a statistic if there isn't any place for her to go? She's become a statistic at all of these places inquiring about housing. So uh, anyway, that, that was one setback from them. I could feel a little bit of pushback. But to their credit, because I was persistent, they allowed me to set up a fund. And that's where these other women came in over in the Ecumenical Council. We set up a little treasury over there, and uh, the women got behind it, and they were talking in different places that they went about the growing need for a place for women that were on the street. So <clears throat> they, they, that's very good. And then they even allowed me to name it the Abby Kelly Foster Fund because it was very near the um, bicentennial of the city. And uh, one woman, um, Amy Guyen, I think her name was, wrote and was the predecessor to the Worcester Magazine, this whole remarkable story of Abby Kelly Foster, who'd fallen into anonymity, you know, all, during all of those years. And now her, her presence was being resurrected. And I thought, wow, I read her life. I went to the Antiquarium Society. I read her letters. I thought, Oh my God, she couldn't even get a place to sleep in some areas because they didn't want a, an anti-slavery person in their homes. So I thought, I said, what a perfect name for this kind of shelter. In the meantime, the, the women here and the few women here got together and we formed a collective and invited other women into it and we started to plan and we knew that it couldn't be, uh, it couldn't do everything. We were just gonna try to keep women off the street at night so that they wouldn't be raped and that they wouldn't have to prostitute because I had been in front of the Aurora uh, several times and talking with women waiting out there to pick up someone to go in. So I, I just said, well, why are you doing it? She said, if you haven't been on the streets of Worcester, taking a chance with some guy in a hotel room is a lot better than being outside. So one of the women who joined the collective was a former street woman herself, Lucky Clark, God rest her. She died um, about 10 years ago. She said, Annette, I'm taking you to the weeds. 
you're going to find a lot of women down there. So I went to the weeds, which are all those bushes that are by the railroad track near the Y, WCA. And that's a living place for people that couldn't find it. So I talked to a lot of women down there. So the statistics were growing, the, the uh, unorthodox statistics that I called them. And uh, so anyway, about the second the f year and a half into it, with the pushback, I was getting a couple of remarks like, look, this is from Bishop Harrington. We settled, us, we settled the score after this was all over. He said to me, Annette, you've got a great reputation as a teacher. My sister, who's Sister Nora, sister of St. Joseph, she said, you're at the tops where you are. Why don't you go back to that teaching? And I said, well, why? He said, you're not a social worker. What do you know about these things? And I said, I'm not a social worker, but let's go back to your saying I was a great teacher. Do you know what I learned the first thing? If you don't know the answer, find somebody who does. If you can't do the task, introduce somebody to it and work together and learn. I said, I know how to delegate, I know how to ask. And I said, I never expected this to be a one woman operation. This is a group effort. And uh, well, he, he said no more. But by the end of, uh, it got very unpleasant, very unpleasant. And it felt like unwelcome at a meeting. And finally, in June of 1975, after two years of enduring this, and I have to say, poor Frank, he's very, very kind and very understanding. And Annette, don't give up, don't give up, you know. So um, they decided not to do it. So that's when the dam broke. I said, that's it. I quit. I'm, I'm going to do it. I said, it was hard to explain, and it still is today. It's kind of like one of those personal mysteries. Somewhere between 1973 and 1975, I just had flipped over. I, could, I knew I couldn't go back. I, I just couldn't go back to where I was. I had to go forward. And so uh, whatever the the odds were going to be, we went forward. And we met in December, formed a group. We sat around in St. John's Rectory. Frank was very sad. Don't do it, Ed, don't. I said, Frank, I have to, I can't, I can't. Uh, he was upset with me. So uh, we formed groups, fundraising, continued fundraising. Um, who was gonna supply the uh, the linens and uh, all of the, what you needed for kitchen. Uh, how are we going to get beds? How are we going to get furniture? How are we going to publicize? Well, that's where this group had come in. And the year before, they had done that conference that I talked about. And in 1974 at the Y, they introduced the concept of having a shelter. So before we opened the door, it had kind of been born into the minds of Worcester people that it was going to take place. So um, we, we had everything in place. We had growing interest, more and more people coming. What can I do? Uh, is it going to be possible for me to be part of it? I said, we have a collective, join the collective, and we'll work together to see what gifts we can share and what we can do together. So um, we did, and we had our last meeting in April of 1976 at Hogan up at Holy Cross because two important women from Holy Cross were connected to us. And that was Anna Keynes, she was the sister of St. Joseph who was the first woman chaplain there. And Eileen Dooley is the director of students. And that's where Abby's friends connected to Abby's. And they've been staffing the shelter for 39 years. That it's, the group has grown, grown, grown. Well, anyway, uh, guess what? Everything was in place, but we didn't have a place. Nobody wanted to rent. So uh, miraculously, um, into the last meeting came this woman, uh, who was still around, an activist in the Beacon area near in Maine South, Carolyn Packard by name. I call her Abby Kelly Foster's spirit. She came in and she sat down. She'd never been to a meeting before. And she said, have you looked at Lower Crown? There's a red brick building down there that on one side seems to be empty. Why don't you take a look? So two of us left the meeting, went down, and there was a young man on the porch smoking. I've never 
quite remember what it was, a cigar or a pipe. I said, are, are you the landlord? He said, no, I'm a friend of his. The landlord is in the house over here and he's uh, painting. So we went in, I said to her, now Mary, we're gonna tell him the truth. That this is what we wanna do, because I don't wanna have anything happen afterwards that they shut us out. So he came down off the ladder and uh, we explained what we, who we were, what we wanted to do. And he said, oh, come right over and look. So we went to the 21 side of the house, uh, 23 side of the house rather, and we looked at that first floor. And um, mm, it had possibility, but it wasn't really going to be what we had in mind. There was a, two large rooms separated by a French door and a bathroom off of that with a bathtub, a large dining room and a smaller kitchen. And mm, I didn't know. So he said, well, why don't you look upstairs? And I said, Harry, we only have rent for one floor. He said, oh, come on, look upstairs. So we went up and it was perfect. It had one private room. And at the same time, why it was important to us about the private room is that they deinstitutionalized the Worcester State Hospital almost simultaneously with what was happening here with the, uh, the um, urban ministry and with the collective of women. And uh, I thought, well, if we ever got someone that was out of, a little out of control, that would be a good place. And there were two semi-private, two big rooms that would have accommodated four or five beds and a crib or a couple of cribs, a nice bathroom with a shower. And, uh, oh, I said, boy, this is perfect. He said, well, I'll give you the two floors. And I said, well, we only have money for one. He said, I'll give it to you for the price of one. So now this is 1976. The value of the property then was $33,000. We had the rent upstairs and downstairs, $325 a month for two floors with heat and light. It was like, where had this woman been all the time we were trying to find a place? So I knew it was, <laughs> I said it was her spirit, it had to have been. She led us there. So in one month, we furnished that place up and down with furniture from the kids leaving colleges that dumped stuff out into the dumpster. And um, Jim O'Coin, who was still at Denholm, the old Denholm building, and you, you remember those days, he gave us a great break on uh, frame beds and mattresses. And uh, we furnished the whole place. We had no washing machine, no dryer. So for the first three months, four women would come by every morning, pick up the laundry, and have it back by supper time. <laughs> it was, that's how we, how we worked it. And it was like a field of dreams. If you do it, they'll come. Not, not just the, the homeless, the homeless women, uh, uh, with, the, with or without their kids, but the city, the grassroots. There was such a remarkable response to it. And I think it was that groundwork that was laid for the two years that we were struggling with the unorthodox uh, you know, uh, statistics, trying to get this out into the public and the work that the women did over here at the Ecumenical Council. So uh, from 1976 to 1980, we worked with the homeless. And it was slow starting, but gradually, the word got out, people came. The database, we now call it a database, our donor base began to increase and we were able to pay the month's rents without too much difficulty. And um, we had this naive idea that the city would never stand for homeless women being on the street with kids, especially with kids, and, uh, or the state, or the country. What's happened to us? They talk about losing moral authority now. I, I was thinking we had lost it way back then. And um, in 1980, um, 81, we kind of decided we had to stick it out because President Reagan cut funding for HUD and that really scuttled the idea of affordable housing. And in that year, 1980, 81, we decided to stick it out that was one thing that happened. 
we'd, we'd stay the course because we started something and you couldn't turn our backs on, the, on these women now. Um, 1980, that, that, that happened and um, Harry decided to sell the house to Beacon Corporation that was going to develop the old Warren shoe factory that was at the foot of the hill and sell it to become um, housing for elderly and uh, uh, handicapped people. And he was going to get a good price for that house. So we were in dilemma there. So we had this issue of selling the house, Reagan cutting HUD, state hospital continuing decentralization, but another miracle occurred. Janet, the late Janet McCorrison, who was the head of Worcester Heritage, that's now Preservation Worcester, was trotting through the neighborhoods. We didn't even know this was happening, trying to earmark historical buildings in the Crown Hill neighborhood because it was the oldest residential neighborhood of the city, um, the third to become recognized as such, but originally. And she came down Lower Crown Street one day. We had no idea. And she put a, 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 histor a historical marker on the house. This was the Carter Whitcomb house. Now, he was a manufacturer. And uh, his daughter, Cecilia, who lived in back uh, on Oxford Street, uh, had gained much fame during World War II by being uh, protesting Wilson's entry into World War I. And she'd gone to jail for that. So I'm sure she, he wasn't pleased about that. But that Whitcomb family had a history in Worcester. So what happened? Harry couldn't sell the house because it now had a historical marker on it. But what did he do? He raised the selling price. So we went to the city, got a block grant, filled out all the papers for a block grant, submitted it, and then city manager Mulford decided it didn't meet the criteria. So we had to do a, some more planning. And these are all these innocent women that, you know, that we were supposed to go back to our pre previous lives because we didn't know anything other than what the one thing, one talent we had. They all said, we all got together, what are we going to do? And somebody said, let's get the city council over here. We'll have them over for breakfast and see what happens. So uh, we invited them all. And do you know, six, seven of them came. And so we had a woman from the state hospital that was with us. And she was what Jerry Seinfeld would call a close talker. And she served food almost right in your face. They were terrified of her. But she was the loveliest person. And they all came in. And they all told their stories. And within 48 hours, we had a check for 33000 to buy, to buy the house. <laughs> from, they gave it with a caveat that the house would be used only for social uh, service purposes. And on the other side, you could have staff or um, you, know, you can use it for whatever you wanted on the other side, but it would have to pertain to something related to the, um, <clears throat> to the shelter. So in the meantime, we were scuttling around because Harry had raised the price. We had 33,000, he was up to 56,000. So um, Elaine, yeah, who was one of the most faithful and longest running and a dear friend of mine forever and ever, went down to Kay Marquette, uh, who was then the uh, CEO of Greater Worcester Foundation, and practically th threw herself over the desk saying, Kay, you got to help us. We need discretionary funds. And uh, she was able to come up with quite a few discretionary funds. And the rest of us contacted every human being in our family that we knew. And it was the families that put it all together, along with Greater Worcester Foundation. And we met the selling price. And by 19, the fall of 1981, we had actually the ownership of the house. So what were we going to do with this side of the house? Because we couldn't see expanding the shelter because it, it would seem too much at the time. We needed to raise money for it. So we started a woman's center on the other side that we called Worcester Connection. And the community that I still belong to supported it. And several other communities did. And we became like a woman's center. We had um, a group called Sisterhood is Powerful that met there. And the purpose of that 
was to introduce women who probably never would have met a homeless person in their whole life, but to come down and to come and see the shelter, come and meet, and we had discussions on uh, various issues on the other side, and it's amazing how many women came, ended up staffing in the shelter. And so it worked both ways. We used it as an uh, activist center. We had nuclear freeze groups there. We had people in solidarity with Central America. We had a lending library. Um, all kinds of activity was going on in there. Weekends, uh, uh, you know, educational weekends. And I was, at the time, uh, very friendly with Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza because I'd taken a theology, feminist theology course from her at Notre Dame and I invited her to come up and do a weekend. So she came and we would had all kinds of activity there and with the purpose in mind that these women who would come would feel free to come and meet the people in the shelter. So uh, it lasted for eight years but then the funding sources kept thinking we need to do more for the homeless. So we knew that we couldn't afford any longer to keep it. So we changed it into a thrift store. And um, it began in 1988. 80, yeah, 88. And on the other side of the house, we started a woman's center for former guests uh, so that they would have a place to come and call home away from home once they left us that they could feel free to come back. So there, there was a lot of what I would call economic development going on in that house from 1981 to about 18, uh, 1989. And our donor base was increasing. Uh, those of us who were remained in the collective would go out speaking and we went all over the place to speak about it, to connect people to us. So by 19, 89, 1990, we had enough money to be able to say, let's look at what we can do with the house next door that was a drug, it was a drug place. It was awful. It was terrible. And um, it burned. So as there was a drug deal that went bad and uh, they set it on fire. <clears throat> so the selling price wasn't going to be that great. So we wrote a letter to all the donors we contacted uh, mass um, home funds because we don't take their funding for any of our programs, but we would take it for rehabbing a building. So we got home funds and our donors matched the home funds and we were able to renovate 19 for 16 units so that women could transition from the shelter there. And there's a, a handicapped apartment downstairs that uh, could, if a woman and kids could be down there, there's several bedrooms and a couple of bathrooms and it met all the code. And the fellow who did it was both the contractor and the architect, Ted Skoda. And um, one of the things I like to tell people, and I'm sure you will be interested in it, uh, a lot of young people aren't, but I think there's a certain generation that loves this kind of story. It had the most gorgeous, what I call gone with the wind circular staircase in it from the first floor to the fourth. It had been completely destroyed by the fire. And this fellow was born uh, with relatives born in, um, I think, Holland or somewhere in the Netherlands. Dione van Gerven, he's a woodmeister from North Brookfield. Every day for a year and a half, he came in <clears throat> and shaped wood uh, with a brace from the top to the bottom. Every, faithfully, he kept turning it every day a certain amount so that the staircase was restored. And it is glorious to look at. And the only piece of, actually, the only wood that was left on that was this f door. That's the original wood. That was the only thing left. But was just wood like this that he took. So when I take anyone in there, I just love to have them oh, stand here and look up to the top there. So it opened with glory to 16 women in 1993. And I thought, wow, we, we just, a lot has been accomplished. A lot has been accomplished. And Kathleen O'Connor, <laughs> who's our lawyer, called our director and said, do you know the house around the corner is going on the market? It's up for auction. Wouldn't it be a great place for families? So I said, said to Elaine particularly, 
oh my God, how many more? I, I said, this, I never thought this would end. But do you know that at the bottom of Chatham Street, down on the corner of Newbury, is an old house, 100 Chatham, where Abby Kelly Foster died. That was her, where she died. And I thought, well, Alla came from New Hampshire and from Boston and must have taken her for a carriage ride up that hill. And they must have seen that house. And Abby was, um, I wouldn't call her odd, but she was unique. <laughs> she probably said, oh, this would be a much better place than that old boarding house I'm living in. So what do we do? We did the same thing with 77 that we did with, uh, with um, uh, 19. And it, we added a, a, an apartment and um, a woman center in the back of it. But what's lovely about this is the colors that the um, contractor picked are the same kind of Victorian colors that they had in that day. And the original slate is still on the house. And the, it is Italianate designed. And, uh, you know, in all of this, you're understanding the Crown Hill neighborhood was unbelievably supportive. They loved the idea. They would have preferred, of course, individual families. But we keep our property really in good shape. And uh, the houses are beautiful. And I think the women, once you keep it beautiful, the women who live in it keep it nice, too. And uh, so anyway, at the end of 1996, when we opened the doors, who comes knocking on the door but the Sisters of Mercy? They're down at uh, 52 High Street. And um, they're, they run out of uh, resources. Not so much money, but the sisters are older and they're worn and uh, there's nobody that really wants to do this. So they've been looking at different organizations and at the missions and they thought their mission of low income women would blend in with ours, homeless, abused uh, women and uh, we could just expand the mission. So it took about two years to decide would we do this because the way we raise our money, the old fashioned way, is very hard and it's very taxing. And um, it's lots of fun, but it's hard work. And uh, so we, we had to play it back and forth and the board finally decided, look, what do you think will happen to that building if, we don't, if someone doesn't take it? And I know the church is always in need of more parking space. And I figured, we, th we thought maybe that might happen, taking down the building. Then. So we decided we'd go with it. And um, in June of 2001, uh, they handed over the ceremonial key uh, to the uh, president of our board. And um, <clears throat> we leased the building. Uh, until 2006 when we took ownership. And the reason we had to wait those years to take ownership was because there was an oil leak from the rectory right onto the sister's property. And it took quite a while to clean that up. So in 2006, we bought the it's 52 High Street that has 52 housing units in it for $1. And they, the Sisters of Mercy Somewhere in their history, I, someday when we, I, we ever get together again, I'll show you their, the history of their organization. Uh, some woman, I th nameless, left a dollar for a nest egg uh, to the sisters to be used for something in the future. And nobody knew what it was, but the dollar must have taken on some kind of a really special uh, meaning to them. So the sale of the house was a dollar. And uh, there were 52 units in it. And um, these women are many of them mothers with uh, families that, um, well, some of them stay connected, others don't. They're hardworking women. Some of them are working two and three jobs. Uh, there are some on SSI that can't work. Um, and, uh, but there are 52 people, 52 women, uh, who are in need of and can't afford uh, the the rents of Worcester and many of them have found jobs that many of them can't find jobs right now and they're it's they're struggling 
So anyway, that brings us up to the present time. And just telling the story, it's so interesting, but it's exhausting <laughs> when you think of all the effort. But the thing, the thing that makes it so exciting is that it wasn't done alone. I can tell the story, but I can tell you there are so many people involved in this whole thing. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Whether they stayed staffing, whether they were in the reception room, whether they worked in the women's center, whether they cooked a meal, it, it's, uh, it's unending, the number of people and the grassroots that have kept this organization going. And uh, I, that's why I wanted to bring this to, to see as it kind of a tribute, not to the founder, because I, I never thought of myself as the founder. I thought of myself as the catalyst, because so many people have founded this place. So there are four buildings now, and would I ever have said it in back in 1980? We could use another building. There's not enough space. There's not enough space. But I did want to bring this because last year I had to um, give a talk at our gala, and I, I didn't want not to say this. If I could, if you wouldn't mind if I did said this, but just a, a few words here. I, I kind of end my little part. Oh, come on, Annette, where are you? Yeah. That's crazy. I had five pages. Ah, here you are. I'd just like to say this. Now, we stand with four buildings under one name, Abby's House, where all of us, the staff, the residents, the shelter guests, and the volunteers, receive each day the best education on what it means to work in mutuality. <coughs> to achieve independence and to have his, her, or their own place to get a decent wage to be able to provide for their families still remains overwhelming. But despite the obstacles facing the women and their children and facing all of us, the barriers that sometimes seem unsurmountable to get past become, we still remain dreamers, creators, believers in the power of women to overcome the odds of living on the edge, sometimes very much close to the edge, of relentlessly trying to build something better, sometimes out of nothing. So for all of those who have been founders of Abbey's, thank you, your partners and your supporters, and Abby's remains as one donor, refers to it in her description of Abby's, a stunning tribute to what women can do. So, that is uh, up to now. And what do I do there right now? <clears throat> I worked in all the areas of Abby's. I've never been the executive director. I've always been the catalyst. I've been the, the, the person who's gone out and gotten people interested in it and uh, worked hard to uh, keep these places available for the women and children. <clears throat> and I write letters to people and I used to do all the thank yous for everything by hand, uh, but uh, things are changing because there's a marvelous new um, database person who said to me, you should save your handwriting, I can personalize every letter and all you'll have to do is sign a net. <laughs> so I am reveling in the sunlight of having not to do every single thank you letter. So we've come into the 21st century, I guess. So, But it's been a wonderful life. And uh, one of the reasons um, I left the sisters was not only some difficulties that I was having with my experience with the church, but also and mostly because this needed full time. I'm still very much connected to the women I entered with and I go back often. And now, sadly, I'm going back for funerals because we're, we're down to a very few. And uh, 
they were all we're all over 80 now and uh, so uh, anyway that's my story Annette, have yeah. you ever calculated how many women and children Abby's house has helped over the years yes yes um, Justina was telling me the other day it's close to it's it's close to 18,000 yeah maybe even more when you consider uh, the women who come in to see the advocates that don't necessarily stay with us, but come in. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I just said, very interesting you should ask that question. There was um, a, a donation that came in this week from a woman up in, I don't know, someplace in Maine at this point, and she sent it in honor of Polly Jones, who was the um, shelter advocate. And she said, I was having trouble with uh, a roommate and I didn't know what to do and I came into Abby's one day and I sat down with your shelter advocate and she stayed with me for an hour and gave me some wonderful suggestions of what to do and it changed my life. She may not even remember me but I will never forget her. So it's, it's women of that and I, I did send, show it to Polly and uh, she's, um, she's so excited. She was so shit, I do not remember the woman, but I don't know how she wouldn't because she sees about so many people a day. So it's about, I would say, close now, edging up to eight, uh, 18,500, you know, and uh, they don't move as much in the shelter as they did in the early days because there's no place for them to go. There's no place for them to go. And we were, we were, uh, we were alarmed, a little bit alarmed at, um, in a perfect world, I think the plan that the Worcester Housing Authority put forth would be a wonderful thing, but this is in a perfect world. And for some people, I could think right now of five women, if they got into a Worcester Housing Authority apartment, that would be the ultimate of their life. That, that would be an achievement. They can't go beyond it. They're not able to. And I keep thinking, how many people in those apartments, where would they go once they got out? Because for many of them, that is their, that achieving, their crowning glory. And I, I feel, you know, I don't know what, Ray, I would love to sit down with him sometime and just say, you know, we've got to start pushing for affordable housing. You know, affordable housing. It's a great idea, but what are you going to do with all those people? So that's just between us anyway. What the future hold? Well, we have a new executive director, lovely woman, Stephanie Page, the perfect person for a nonprofit like Abby's. I, I knew the minute that I heard her say what her style of leadership was, that she was going to be perfect. She said, I'm, I'm a strong person, but I don't like to lead at the top of the pack. She said, I like to stand in the middle and work cooperatively with the strength around me. I said, oh my God, this is, I mean, where do we find her? <laughs> the perfect person. And I think that to me, we've got to do some renovation of 52 High. It's a beautiful building, but it has only one furnace for four floors up and three floors out. One thermostat in the whole house. It needs a new electrical system. It needs, a, we want to improve what we have and we want to do something um, probably more helpful if we can be more. We've tried to be in every way, do something to improve life for, for services that we have now. But already the talk is that what are we going to do with all these people? That, that talk is in the making. So I really don't know what the future will bring, but I know there's going to be a future. And I I'm, probably won't be on this side of the universe to see it, but I think it will go forward. If there were more affordable housing, and I think we could probably see ourselves going out of business, which would be a good thing, would be a very good thing. So anyway, that's all. for myself, I just will keep on going and um, you know, doing the little I can do for the public relations. I guess that's what it is. I know so many people connected to Abby's, you know, and at the end of a letter, I can always write something 
personal because I've known them for so long. And I think that makes a big difference, you know, uh, when you're connecting with people, not just to have it be donations, but somebody that really cares about what you're, you've done. So I'm hoping that we can, uh, we have wonderful services for women, but we need to do more with what we have. And I think I'd love, this is just me dreaming, I'd like to see a couple more advocates, you know, for the women. They're the ones we have are excellent, but they're burdened, like so many of the social workers that get bad reputations because they forget to visit a kid's house. Well, if you could see some of the cases that these women have in social services, it's, it's unconscionable. How can they take care of 23 or 24 families? So we need to do, I'd like to see that, that 52 High Street renovated uh, so that it's more comfortable for the women. It is very institutional and our other buildings are more homey. But um, I keep saying to the women, hey, while the funding is not coming, while things are coming back in the, in the, in the uh, you know, funding sources are coming back. But I said, the main thing here, these women are safe. And I think that's the main thing. So, anyway. Um, Annette, how could someone seeing this help? What, in what way could they be of service to Abby's house? How could they get a be of service? Be of service. Be of service to Abby's house. We have a wonderful volunteer coordinator and they can always apply to work in some one of the areas. But I, I keep thinking there's one area that um, we used successfully for the funding of 77 Chatham, and that was house parties. Somebody that could, you know, be convinced of what we do at Abbey's, know about it, and understand what we do there, and invite 10 friends into the into the into her home, and have somebody from Abby's come, and explain what we're doing. If we have a particular project, and ask them to get behind it with a donation. Some women can't go down there, and I can understand that, you know, that they can't. And but I think that that's one way. Uh, also, in kind donations are always appreciated. Our thrift store raises, I can't tell you close to $100,000 a year for the shelter, for the shelter. It's getting way up there now. It's gone, um, I, maybe it's a little exaggerated, but it was last year over $50,000. So we're on our way to it um, because those women that come to our shelter have nothing. And we still have to pay for heat, for light, for food, for electricity now, for, uh, the, all of the new beddings and, you know, they have uh, towels and face cloths and supplies and everything for that house. And we keep it, it's like a home. It's really like a home. It's not like anything you could ever imagine a shelter would look like. It's beautiful. And um, so they raise the money for that. And it's, it's very successful. I've thrift store. Go down there someday, it's like going into McGinnis's. Yeah, and some days it's like old den homes. Yeah, it's packed with people, and the bargains are great. And uh, so that, that is one way, the contribution of clothing in good condition, and we can sell it, and the prices are unbelievable, unbelievable. And uh, we have quite a few, and anyone in the shelter that comes with nothing, rather than having to send them downstairs and say, well, this woman is in the shelter, give her what she wants. We give them gift certificates so they can go and pick out what they want. There's a very false idea that you can throw any old thing at a homeless person and that they'll be grateful. These are women that have had homes, some of them. They have their own taste. You know, they, they know what looks good on them, even though they're homeless. So you just can't throw stuff at them. You have to give them an opportunity to go down see what's there, and buy what they like. And nobody has to know they're in the shelter because there's a real good clientele from downtown that goes in there. So anyway, that's, that's, one, that's one concrete way. A donation of, on non-perishables for on-site pantry, 
that's another way that women can and men can help out. And uh, it just every day there's something that happens. That uh, there was a little article in the paper that one of the uh, students did that appeared in uh, Telegram Towns about our Thanksgiving, and uh, that we have turkey. We get a lot of turkeys. And I said, yes, we're very lucky. We have turkey all year round. And he called the he called about two weeks ago. The fellow read the article. He said. Uh, now, don't tell me you're going to be t serving turkey at Christmas. And Jean said, no, 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 we're trying. He said, well, what, what would you be serving at Christmas? She said, we try to save up and have a prime rib for the women. You know, really make it a nice Christmas for them. He said, call me a week before. Where do you get it? He said, fairway beef. He said, I'm providing it this year. <laughs> so, I mean, just at that one little article. And the day before yesterday, uh, this, uh, this is a man. And I, there's a study I'd love to do. We have a lot of individual men who are extremely generous to Abby's. Is it a mother? Is it a mother-in-law they saw? Is it a sister? Is it somebody or something has touched them so that they are very, very aware of what it's like? And uh, he came in with a bag, not of, um, used mittens, which we always like to get because, you know, with kids, they're losing them every five minutes. Um, brand new mittens and gloves for women. And Elaine said to him, oh my goodness, this is, he said, you know what? He said, when I was a kid, I was in a situation that I had no gloves. And he said, I have never forgotten what it was like to have cold hands. So, I mean, it just says every day there's some something that touches you that uh, is just incredible. So it's all little things like that. But the thrift store is a huge entity for us, a huge entity. And it's in the music, what was the music room of the Sisters of Mercy downstairs. And it's not uncommon. They have someone come down, go into the back where they have all the household, and she'll stand and say, I took violin in that room. You know, they are, I can still hear the music, you know, in here. So uh, I'm sure that uh, the sisters were happy to know they're making a lot of women happy, you know, down there. So, yeah, I think it's more than, excuse my 100000 but I, I'm sure it's close to $55,000 that they raised. It's, 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 it's in, the, in the pie of how we raise our money. It is an eighth or a seventh of, what we, of our operating expenses. And the stuff isn't junk. It's really good material. So... Anyway, that's uh really clear to us the commitment that you have to this life's work for you, but can you tell us what has this work meant to you? Well, it certainly meant a huge change in my life. It was, you know, I, I keep thinking that I was, you know, well-educated, and uh, in fact, I went through Assumption twice. I got my master's in, in French literature here in the old days, and then in the 70s, I got a, ma a master's in education, uh, religious education, in the days when uh, just that Wayne Rollins was, had the Ecumenical Institute. And um, I had studied at Notre Dame uh, University, and I was influenced by, certainly my feminist thinking uh, was influenced by Elizabeth Fiorenza, but I took two courses in community organizing, which I think kind of gave me the ability to know how to put this whole thing together. And I was also studying different places in the country at St. John's University, BC. I could have gone on. In fact, I think I'd have gone on to get a, a doctorate in one of those areas, but something funny happened on the way to all of that, and that was that those two invitations that changed my whole life and where I got the best education ever. I didn't know a thing 
about what it was like to be homeless. I had no idea. I had always been well cared for. I came from a loving family. I had absolutely no, no idea of what it would have been like to have been torn apart and have, uh, you know, be on the street or going from one friend to another over a period of life. And I took a whole different turn. And I think that the, that education that I got from the women themselves, and that's how I, got, I learned so much about it, was the women instructing me. And I, I don't think I would have changed the, the course of my life at all for, for what I've gained from it. And um, I learned a lot about myself. I further learned that um, what I could do, remember I told you as a teacher, I would find out who could do what. Well, let me tell you, when I was in the early years, I used to staff all the time. I was in that shelter night after night after night. And I learned I wasn't very good at it. I loved talking to the women. I loved getting their stories. I loved opening the door to them. But if there was some difficulty or a very uh, awful phone call, I didn't do well on it. I, I just didn't know how to set a boundary on what I would do. So I was staffing. We had two people on at night. We had two people on at night. And I was staffing over the years with this one young woman who sat always reading a book and never interacted with the women. But when she got on the phone, she was incredible. So I figured that's it. I'm not good on the phone. I'm not good at the door. I said, but I am wonderful talking to the women. I can get a lot out of them. I can, you know, let them do all the talking. And I learned that was the best advocacy. Don't give them advice. Let them tell you what their story is and let them find their answers as they talk to you. And that's what would be happening. They would resource each other. And I was there as their student, and I was learning. And I, I learned a very, very powerful lesson my second year there when a young woman was brought in with her two kids. She was found on Route 20 um, by a staffer who brought her to the shelter. She was a domestic violence victim. She put her two kids to bed, and I was staffing with another woman this night. And um, she began, the woman who came in, I'll call her Anne, started to talk about how awful it was, what a brute the husband was, how awful he was, and that the money was all tied up in his name. Her name wasn't on any of the checkbook. There was no way she could get out because there wasn't an escape clause, which if she had a checkbook with her name on it too, she might have gotten some resources to get out. The woman I was staffing with her, is this going to be recorded? It probably is, but it's a bad word. <laughs> he said, she said to him, why don't you leave the SOB? Well, she said, well, there were good times, too. She began to defend him. And I'm looking at the woman saying to myself, why did you say that? And by the end of the evening, she woke up her kids, called a cab, and left. And I think afterwards, we talked about it at staff meeting. I said, he was her SOB. Don't you ever call him an SOB again because she's going to defend him. And that's exactly what happened. So uh, there was a whole other lesson I learned. Not, not uh, you know, what happened in the, the Toulouse Theater back <laughs> in the 1800s, but what happened in this life right now, you know? So I was learning. And I, I've often revisited some of the comments that um, the priest, one of the priests on the urban ministry made, saying you don't have the experience, you don't have the money. Well, we, we got the money. We ha worked hard to get it. But it was true. We didn't have the experience. But I, I would love to sit down with them someday and say, I got the experience from the people that had the experience. I really became a student. And uh, I don't think I would have traded it for, for anything. So that's what gave me the, I think, the impetus to go forward. I've always gone in a learning position. And uh, 
forward all these years because every day you learn something different. You learn, first of all, that most of the women will tell you only what they want you to know. You're never, ever, ever going to get the full story, ever. So you can't make a judgment. So that, that was hard for me because I grew up in an Irish family when my father knew, and you know, you're right, and you'd come down like that. And I, I, I had a tendency to be that way. And every day I watched myself on that. You can't make a judgment. You can only go by what they tell you. And you can't judge these women. You don't, nev never know where they've been, what their experience has been. So it's been kind of like a, staying in a learning position, being open to, um, you know, to being vulnerable, I guess that's what it is. And uh, so it's kept me, kept me moving anyway. And uh, I, I'm never, I'm always amazed at the courage of the women, you know, really and truly. In fact, I said to one of them, I, uh, this is my early days of the year, I said, would you ever consider giving those of us on staff here, you know, an idea of how we would survive a day in the city? Oh, I would tell you. I can tell you all the places to go where you can go into the best bathrooms in the city and they have facilities where you can wash up and everything and where you might go to get... They, I mean, this is early, the early learning. And, and um, I said to her, well, where did you... <laughs> I said to her when she had this, this kind of the old, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, a shawl. But it wasn't a shawl. It was a... My mother had one of them. It was fur with a little fox mouth and on her. I said, where did you get that shawl? She said, this rabbit from Newton Hill. Somebody killed it and put it together and made a shawl for her. I said, oh, well, that's something new. I didn't know that, you know, so. So anyway, it just, I know I'm babbling on, but there's so many things in my mind about, you know, what was important to me. And I think that was it, to be always in a learning position. And, uh, not that I disc discredit any of my education because I loved every bit of the education that I had and I loved every kid that I ever taught. And I just feel very lucky to have had walked into this experience and to have been able to be part of shaping this organization. And uh, well, I always think... After a lifetime of taking yeah, care of yeah, people, yeah, seeing yeah, needs, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I get that. Lot yeah. Yeah. What advice would you give? What advice would you give to women today? To, to, today? Yeah. To, well, uh, all I can say is to be uh, to women today. Go for it. Whatever opportunity is there, go and don't be afraid. You know, you can. It, it, there's always going to be support. There'll there'll be support. Go ahead. Try it. Don't don't spend the rest of your life saying if I only had, if I only did or if I only could have, if I only took a chance. Take a chance, yeah, definitely, and you don't know what will come. And if you fail, fine, that's good, you took the chance. You know, so I would say, the women are quite amazing though, really and truly. When I read the book, you know, your books about the interviews, isn't it amazing what women have done? You know, and I think well, it- You think your story is amazing too? Well, well, I don't know. Do you, I, I always like to pass on the compliments to the many, many people I worked with because it wouldn't, and our volunteers, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for the volunteers. I call them the sturdy backbone of the organization. Oh, nice yes, story. yeah, they're wonderful. And uh, I'm just glad that I've been able to be around for these years to solidify the base. And it seems to be pretty solid now and new people can carry it on. And it may not be the same, look the same, but the mission is the same. And, uh, you know. Well, you've got uh, a wonderful legacy, and I know thousands. Uh, well, thousands well, thank you. I never you. think of it that way, you know. We thank you for today. This has thank been a marvelous interview. Well, well, is it? Yeah, I feel like I talked and so talked and talked. Nervous, right? <laughs> oh, my Did goodness. Did you forget the camera was even there? Yeah, okay. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank both of you thank for you doing. So you know so what? I have so to tell much. you, I was so thrilled to know that the two of you were doing this from Assumption. Oh. 
really and truly, because I had really and truly, because a lot of people felt like it had gotten so conservative here. And I thought, when I saw your two names, I said, absolutely, this is great. This is great. I'm so happy. And uh, I, I think of all that's going on, you know, for women here. Do they still have the women's courses and the, the, that, the, oh, the minors? That wonderful. Yeah. And I remember because Angela, mm -hmm. I visited yeah. her for all those years, all those years. And uh, Karen is, isn't here, is she anymore? Karen, she was some up in New York State. I can't even think of her last name. And I know that, um, oh, book, book Bear, she's gone too. She, she's retired from oh, here. Regina. Regina, yeah. Regina, yeah, Gina Edmund. She's on, uh, I love her. She's great, yeah. And so. um, I wanted to mention to you, I, I'm friends with Kathleen O'Connor. Oh, you yeah, are? Oh, yeah. Well, she's amazing. Yeah, she oh, my gosh. She's just wonderful. She's good? Yeah. 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 She is an 